representatives from the the, um, the chamber have come out that they'll be speaking with us about an issue that's critically important to our community and every community whether we consciously pay attention to it or not we we're chatting here informally about the price of gasoline and what our tolerance level is and when we will change habits and, and it seems as a people we just get used to whatever happens in, in the industry and um, it takes a long time for us to change but it's an area and an issue that we must at least be cognizant of so that we as chamber businesses board members representatives have an understanding of what's here today what may be coming down the pike and what if anything we can do to help impact uh, what it is that we're going to get as the future of energy unfolds. With that, I'll introduce uh, Matt Cook. Matt is going to be our primary speaker this morning, and then we'll be joined, and his presentation will be supplemented, can I say that too? By, the, oh, <laughs> by our, very, our very effervescent city utilities uh, director, Tim Luxinger. And if you haven't had the opportunity to even interact with Tim, he's relatively new on the job. He's doing a great job for us trying to keep energy prices low so that your businesses can be as effective as they are. Let me give you just a brief intro on Matt. And then, Matt, I think it's, it'll be more effective for you just to share some of your experiences and what has brought you to the U.S. Chamber and, and how you're utilizing all the paths that you done, all the past work that you've done. Okay. Currently he's Vice President for Oil, Sands, and Arctic Issues at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for 21st Century Energy. And that really is the entity that has uh, been in contact with us through Nate Prouty and set up the meetings today. They're going around to various communities and having these small conversations, um, intimate conversations by design, by choice, as uh, they wanted to get the message across without inviting a lot of um, mm, passionate, uh, unreasonable, in some people's <laughs> minds, <laughs> uh, visitors to the table. So we're going we're gonna to share some information today that we think as business people is really important to, um, to your efforts. Anything else you want to add to that? No, I'll just hit right in. Why don't we let yeah. you go? Um, I'm going to use the podium just because the slide clicker is there. Um, thank you all for coming, and Cindy, thank you for hosting us, and, and Tim, thanks for helping out. Um, on my background, I usually have the uncomfortable spot a little bit, but I, uh, I've been at the chamber for about a year and a half. I came over from the American Petroleum Institute, where I was a lobbyist, uh, working primarily on refining and uh, fuels and environmental related issues. The um, Prior to that, I'd worked in the Bush administration. I was in the White House for almost two years, and I was in the uh, Department of Energy for the first year of Bush administration, and had a long, lengthy past um, prior running campaigns, and working for a couple of members of Congress. I worked for the New York State Legislature, and I also worked for the Texas Governor's Office in Washington for a brief stint, too. Also, um, so this project I've been working on, I've been brought over to the chamber to work on, it relates primarily to um, Canadian energy. I'll get into that in just a minute, but. Um, first, as Cindy indicated, I worked for the Institute for 21st Century Energy, we're an organization that's part of the U.S. Chamber that was started about five years ago when a lot of businesses across business sectors were recognizing that the impacts of energy and the lack of an energy policy, a true focused energy policy, was affecting all businesses and that we needed to get some more focus and attention, not just on the negative policies and, and, and addressing negative policies, but really getting out and talking about positives. And, what our country uh, could take advantage of and what were some of the, the benefits and opportunities that um, we could realize. And um, so as a result, we, we to form this organization. There's about 12 employees or so. Uh, the first uh, president was um, uh, General Jones, who went on, left after a year to go and become uh, President Obama's um, national security advisor. And then my boss, Karen Harbert, who was um, the uh, Secretary of Energy's top policy advisor in the second half of the Bush administration. She came on to head up our organization. <clears throat> and really what we promote um, is a, a true all of the above energy policy. When we say that there's a lot of, that, that it's kind of been thrown around a lot more and more these days, but some people have very different views on that. 
we, we believe that we need all of the energy we can we can utilize in this country. We have a growing economy. We have a lot of opportunity, and um, whether it's use of, and I'll speak I'll typically speak more to obviously fossil energy because that's more of my background. But um, nuclear is very important. Uh, the use of renewables is important. Um, the use of uh, and finding efficiencies are very important, and they all have a role in our in our uh, energy picture going forward. So, um, as part of that. Uh, Using, utilizing my uh, campaign background as well as some of my experience in working uh, in government and, and as a lobbyist. Um, I, when I was at API, I had started working on some Canadian energy issues and Canadian oil sands issues. And when I came over to the chamber, um, we decided to create this program called the Partnership with Fuel America. And it's a, really was focused on, uh, you know, about a year and a half or so ago, we started to look at the, the lack in the, of, of understanding across the country about Canadian energy and its role and importance in the United States. And obviously the Keystone XL issue came up and it has elevated Canadian power and Canadian, uh, the use of Canadian oil um, in, the, in the public's consciousness. But prior to that, we would go through slides and we talked to people and, and you know, more often than not, you'd, have, you'd ask the question, how, how, where do we get most of our uh, oil from? Who do we import more of our oil from? And it was always Saudi Arabia or, or Venezuela or someplace like that. And it's Canada. And, and um, and there's, there was a lack of recognition for that. So we felt as a chamber, um, we, we should be getting out and touting those benefits, and we needed to try to start educating other businesses and getting them more engaged. And, um, and, and as a result, we, we, we decided to build this partnership to Fuel America, and it was to go out and talk to, to business leaders and people in communities who either have an interest or should have an interest in this issue, um, across energy sector, or across sectors, not just in the energy business, but but who really um, understand that there's there's benefits here, but but also you know as a result we've got had, had started to recruit businesses in 11 states, where um, in, in touting these these benefits, um, I'll get into 11 states in a minute, but for us at, at the chamber there, there's no greater ally than Canada as, as we look at it as a trade partner. And we import uh, this number, 1.9 million barrels. That, that estimate's going to go up to probably 2, 2.4 this year. Um, and even that, that prediction of 3.5 million barrels a day uh, is going to go up. That's about 24% of our oil today that we import comes from Canada. Um, and just as importantly, I have a few things in here about being a reliable ally and what it means to our energy security. But um, currently, there's about 80,000 jobs uh, in about 49 states. <coughs> that are dependent on some sort of export or some sort of manufacturing of goods that are being sent up to Canada in the oil field. Uh, that estimate could go way up if projects that were being built up both in Canada and here in the United States come to fruition. But that's a significant amount of jobs and it's a significant amount of states that are covered. And um, a lot of people don't recognize that either. And in addition, in addition to the goods and services that the Canadians are buying, um, that represents for every barrel of oil, for every dollar that we spend on a barrel of oil, you get about 90% return to the United States in, in, in what they're purchasing from us. So it's a very good rate of return as far as trade, and it's a very good for us for, from the economic benefits and for the energy security benefits. So um, as, as this part of this education component is to get out and talk to people and start to get them to be more engaged and a little more tuned into what's happening. As I mentioned, we're in 11 states, um, picked primarily because of uh, the benefit that they have to uh, from the pipelines that are already coming into this country and supplying uh, oil into the refineries in the Midwest. Um, the, the other, in addition to Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska, we picked because of where they were on the pipeline route and the benefits that they realized from the pipeline. Then North Dakota, also because of the uh, opportunity to put domestic crude into the pipeline uh, in, in western Montana. There's a lot, a lot of bottleneck of, of oil there, so there's there's benefits. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline as well as some of the other pipelines have been proposed to try to get some of that oil um, out of there and into the refineries. So um, Iowa, everybody always asks why there's a hole there. There's just too much going on in Iowa politics. We didn't figure that uh, we'd be lost in the noise and there was no interest in having to go in there and uh, dedicate a lot of resources. And uh, So we, we, we skipped it for now. But um, and we've had a tremendous growth in partnership. We started last year and we're proud to say we started with about 144 members. Uh, and quickly have grown to um, probably closer to 300 today. Uh, when you look at business organizations like state and local chambers, and we, we also have a lot of hospitality association and innkeepers association and coin and tavern operators and trade uh, groups. In, in addition to that, to the businesses, we, we estimate we probably, you know, there's hundreds of, if not thousands, of, of individuals and businesses that we represent across the country and just those 11 states. 
Uh, we've had a couple of other states where we've had members join, one from Arizona, one from Virginia. People have just came across our website and were interested in what we were doing. Um, but in time, we hopefully we'll, we'll broaden this network. But we're also talking a little bit more uh, that about today, uh, well, not just today specifically, but it, the conversations have gotten to be more robust as people are, uh, as we've been doing this, we've been finding people want to talk more than just about Canadian energy. They want to talk about what's happening with natural gas development in Pennsylvania and Ohio. They want to find out what's going on in North Dakota with the 3% unemployment because of oil. They ask about innovations and, what, and what's happening with regulation and, um, you know, what's happening with renewables and, and all sorts of things. So the conversations have become a little more robust and business people are interested in what's happening and where there's opportunity and where there may be problems with regulations. And that's good for us because it gets us tuned in as I go out and about and find out what people are interested in talking about. But we can also help uh, bring messages back to people and bring more information back to you. And that's why we had Tim here. The last time I was um, in Nebraska, we were in, in uh, Lincoln, we had a lot of questions about what was happening with power generation. And, uh, not only to manufacturers but other businesses in the state, simply because, um, as we're talking about, a, a good almost 65, 60, 65 percent of your electricity here is generated from coal, and you get about another 30 percent from nuclear. And with all the changes that are happening, regulations by the EPA, and I have a whole other presentation I could I could get into that for for an hour. But um, what it, what it's meaning then the impact it's having on certainty, and what's the impact it's having on on uh, what people are looking into as far as how do we make investments. Um, as business people, you understand that you don't have to know the lay of the land, you have to know the rules of the road, and, and, and what am I supposed to do, and how am I supposed to invest in some of these plants. Um, some recent EPA regulations, I'm sure Tim will give it a, a really good impact, whether we're gonna be able to use coal or build new coal generation plants, or in a, or beyond that, even use it all, all together you know, going forward. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more, but um, people are very interested in what's happening in the power generation in the state, so I thought it would be good if Tim could spend a few minutes and just talk about that and answer any questions, because it's. It was certainly a, a, a lot of questions on that last time I was here. And I'm more of an oil guy, so I wanted to bring in an expert who can talk to that. Um, and again, I'm the only one available, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cross section of businesses is great. Here's just, just a sample of some of the businesses that we have uh, uh, involved. Um, some are interesting. We have a uh, one refinery in Indiana that joined that's they don't use any, uh, they don't purchase any crude from overseas, it's a, it's a farmer's co op but they felt this was important to, to be uh, involved. Um, I've, I've had a, an interesting variety of everything from uh, steakhouses and, and innkeepers, as I mentioned, to uh, a whole bunch of businesses that are, so it, it's, been, it's been really um, great to get out and about. And, and in addition, um, as I mentioned, we were trying to find people who are thought leaders and business leaders in their communities. We, we don't ask, we haven't asked for a whole uh, a lot. We don't ask for any money. We don't ask for you to, when you join to have to, to, um, to, to contribute financially. We want to put your name on our website and we want to be, ask you to be willing to receive information from us. Uh, we think um, we could be a great resource. We could provide you with um, updates on what's happening in Washington and some other parts of the country and policies or things you may have heard about uh, in your newspapers on the radio. We want to uh, provide you with opportunities if, if, if you're interested to send letters to the White House or the State Department on, on some of these issues. We also want to um, at times, my people want to call you up and ask you if you want to testify at a hearing, whether it's uh, here in, in some part of the state or whether it's, uh, we had one gentleman who was an office supply uh, store owner in southwest South Dakota came to Washington and testified at a labor, a Senate labor hearing for us about the, the benefits that he saw the Keystone Pipeline be built through his state. Um, so they, it, it, we will we'll provide those opportunities, but we really want to be this resource for you and, and be this, build this network enable you to understand that there's other people who are thinking like you and are just as interested in these energy issues and, and again help you um, understand you're not going to all be energy experts but help you make make you better uh, uh, energy advocates going forward. Um, I'll just go through this. I mean you're, you're I use this as a, my presentation in other parts of the country but I just try to talk a little bit about the pipeline and bring people up to date on on the status of the pipeline. Um, in fact, I just got an email this morning that uh, TransCanada folks were going to be in Washington and wanted to meet with my boss and me. Um, but I'm here meeting with you all, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, but we're, we're, you know, we're waiting now. To, obviously, TransCanada's put forth their plan. Uh, the state DEQ is going to review it, is reviewing it, and we're waiting for them to put it on the governor's desk and for him to make a decision on whether he wants to advance a proposal to the administration with TransCanada or not. And uh, as a chamber, the Keystone project for us was a no-brainer. I mean, I'm, most of you support it, but we felt um, 
it's a huge investment by a private sector company that was going to create a lot of jobs and um, that it, it was just you know, with our relationship with Canada, the need for energy in this country, uh, it was a no-brainer for us. And we, we, we've been supporters all along the whole project as well as other projects in the past. And um, we've continued to press that the uh, President should make a decision as soon as possible and make the right decision, we hope, uh, going forward. But um, we certainly understand that it was a need, and I always say this, it was a need for people in, in these communities to understand what was going on. There's a, there's a process, and you have to follow the process. And, um, and there's a, there was a reason that you know, people had, you know, there was some good reason, and perhaps some bad reasons why people wanted to a little bit of understanding what this pipeline was all about. But, um, and then now Nebraska has a better, more robust understanding and a better process in place at, at the state government in order to be able to review these sorts of projects. But um, it, it, we, we, we're going to continue to back it and we're going to try to continue to push whatever, who's a, your president next to, to permit it as soon as possible. And with that, um, I'm just going to again ask if if you're interested, we'd love to have you join. If you haven't joined the partnership already, um, we, we we like to, in addition to providing with information and updates by email or occasionally asking for some other help, um, we try to do these meetings every spring and fall. Uh, we'll see if we can keep up that pace going forward, but to try to do it in some part of the state, if not nearby, in order to continue to have some opportunity for you to have some conversation and ask questions and talk. Um, and so after, perhaps after Tim's done, we can add, answer some questions from you and, and have a little bit of a conversation. If the people will know more about some issues, and I'm, I'm happy to have you jump in and, and get more involved. But uh, going forward, if, if you have a chance and you're interested, please you know, feel free to, to check out our website for more. If you have questions, or, or Nate and is, is around town on occasion, he's happy to help out, uh, answer questions as well. But we'd love to sign you up um, and have you join the partnership. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. I'll give you a little bit of my history. I was invited to come here a couple weeks ago by Cindy to be a spectator. And <laughs> I think, well, free breakfast, I can handle that. And then the end of last week, my one of my counterparts, one of the experts from uh, Lincoln, was supposed to speak about power generation, and she had to bail out, and so here I am. So. Thank you. Um, I've got some slides here. What I wanted to do was kind of talk about energy, electric energy on a, on a national scale and then maybe how it, uh, uh, what we're looking at here in Nebraska in the state. Um, this is the uh, kind of a, a typical rate that customers are paying across the nation. Um, the yellow is good. In Nebraska, we're right there. Uh, we're, we're cheap rates. Uh, a lot of that's because we have a uh, a large amount of coal, nuclear fuel um, generation. Uh, I think it's also because we're a public power state. I think that uh, if you look down the, in the bottom there, you can see what the, the national average and, and the municipal average is for, for bills. And, and I think we're very competitive. I think it's a good way to run a, a power system. I'll do that right. This would be that for, a, for industrial uh, customer. Again, um, what you see here is the yellow states primarily are coal generation. They have a, if you get up the northwest down in um, like the Kentucky, Tennessee area, you get a lot of hydropower, a lot of federal agencies. You can see, especially in the north, uh, northeast and over in California, they're in dark blue. Um, They've got a lot of aging facilities there, especially in California. They uh, they don't have a coal generation in California, believe it or not. They do have coal generation, but they located in Utah, Arizona, and, and ship it over there. But uh, where I'm going with this is there's a lot of concerns in the Northeast, East Coast, the West Coast about about environmental concerns, and. Um, uh, coal is not a, a good um, choice as far as they're concerned. They consider it a, a dirty fuel and you know, we, we say it's economical. That's what we like to look at. Um, but frankly, there's people on either coast that say, well, you guys are just, your, your power costs are too cheap. Uh, we want you to clean up. And uh, if you have to pay the same rates we're paying in California, then you know, that's the way it should be. Um, 
course, we think that that's probably going to impact uh, the economy, manufacturing customers by raising power like that. Uh, so there's a, a large uh, number of people that are in favor of coal, both for, for generation and the, and the supply side as far as mining and that sort of thing. Um, and in the 2000s, uh, there was a lot of capacity being added to the generating grid. Uh, a lot of it was coal, uh, a lot of gas. Um, then, uh, oh, it was probably 2007, 2008, there were new regulations being imposed for environmental uh, controls on, on coal plants specifically. And uh, like I was saying, the, the, the thought was, well, if you guys got to pay more and, and, and be paid when we're paying on the coast, that's fine. And, and uh, um, the, the two regulations that I wanted to talk about was, one was called the cross-state air pollution rule. And it involved basically the eastern half of the United States. It ended up including uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Texas. And it was to address concerns on air pollution in the Northeast because of the, the prevailing winds taking uh, emissions that way. Uh, it was supposed to go into effect uh, while well, they were proposing these things probably around 2009, 2010. The other one was what was called the mercury air toxic rule. And it was to control mercury and, and acid gases, uh, which ultimately means that uh, you're going to have to put scrubbers on the coal units and, and control sulfur dioxide too. And it was viewed at the time by the industry that um, these were going to have a serious impact on the electric industry. Uh, it was going to force us to go to coal, I mean force us to go to, to gas, um, especially in Nebraska there's not a lot of gas capacity around here. So there were concerns about what it might do to rates. And as you can see, back in the mid-2000s, um, rates were going up pretty good. And then around 2008, 2009, things changed. Uh, the economy went south. Um, we didn't have to add capacity like we had been doing during the mid-2000s. Uh, fuel costs started dropping off, the uh, coal started dropping off because of reduced demand uh, for generation and also we started finding uh, natural gas reserves. And you can see, it's kind of tough to read that one, but um, you can see there in 2009 the, the red line was natural gas, the yellow was oil, how those prices uh, dropped. And it wasn't uh, typical, I mean it was, it was typical to see gas prices there in the mid-2000s at seven, eight, nine dollars. Um, I'd seen it over twelve dollars at times and then it dropped down below five dollars and we thought we'd never see natural gas like that again. Um, Part of that was due to reduced demand with the economy, part of it was due to new supplies being found. Uh, we talked about the fracking things going on there in, on the east, eastern coast, uh, uh, up in uh, North Dakota, Canada, they were finding new reserves, or, or not finding new reserves, but it was more economical to, to retrieve those things. Um, so right now there's a, a uh, gas is below $3. They're projecting it to be that way for quite a while. So the end result is uh, the electric utility is switching from coal to gas, but it's turning out it's not necessarily due to environmental concerns, it's, it's due to the, uh, the low price of natural gas. Um, I was just reading about, I think it was in the Canadian storage areas, gas storage areas, they're already reaching the capacity there and they're in the Last I heard up in North Dakota, they're uh, starting to flare off gas because it's it's uh, so cheap and it's interfering with their oil production. I think I saw where one pipeline, gas pipelines, <coughs> going through southern Nebraska, they were looking at converting that to natural gas, or I mean, excuse me, to oil from gas, because they're trying to get oil to east and, and not so much with the gas now. 
Um, so, again, the end result was if you look back in 2009, 2008, uh, the big concern with utilities was, was these air emission rules. Um, they ended up not being as strict as what we thought they might be. Uh, they're also being challenged in court. Uh, the the uh, cross-state air pollution rule uh, was recently stayed uh, at the beginning of the year, and now uh, the, uh, uh, the, the appeals court, the smaller three judges, uh, ruled against it. They sent it back to the EPA, so we're not sure where that's going. Um, how that affects Nebraska. That's a different matter. Um, as you can see, the blue is coal generation. The green is nuclear. You can see a little purple line in, or a little yellow line in here, which is natural gas. Um, we have been increasing the renewables a little bit as far as wind generation. But um, the problem in Nebraska, we've got a lot of the areas that are uh, suitable for wind generation as far as the wind but we don't have a lot of transmission. And I think the low hanging fruit, if you want to call it that, is, has been developed. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with tax credits. Uh, from what we're seeing, I saw in Columbus, they're closing some plants down because that deal with manufacturing towers and that from one generation because uh, they're uncertain what's going to happen next year. But as you can see, the Nebraska utilities are pretty much committed to, to coal. Um, we don't, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of gas capacity here as far as transmission. Um, a few years ago, when the ethanol plants were coming online and they were paying 100% tariff on on gas, and we we were considering building a pipeline down uh, south to uh, Hastings uh, to make sure we had gas for our burning station because we were concerned about gas supplies. And, and since then, the ethanol demand has, has backed off some. Uh, so the utilities are pretty much constrained on what do they need to do um, to meet uh, the proposed air regulations. Uh, it's kind of a hit and miss because you, you, you know, you'll have a two or three year timeline that you need to, to uh, uh, follow through with these modifications as far as uh, the, the design and procurement and construction. And, so you're moving along full speed ahead. We, we, we uh, here in Grand Island, we awarded a contract for some uh, modifications for that cross-state air pollution rule last quarter of last year, and uh, it's about $4 million. And since then, the, the rule's been put on hold, and meanwhile, we're under contract, and at this time, we're installing that equipment because we, <laughs> we uh, that was a good time to do it. So. Uh, we're also making plans for the the mercury and air toxic rule. That'll that'll take place in uh, 2015. That'll be about 35 or 40 million dollar project for us. So we're proceeding with that because we just don't know what's going to happen. And uh, talked to the other utilities in the state, and they're pretty much the same way. They've uh, they entered into contracts with people to do these modifications because they thought it was the time to, uh, thing to do, and and. Uh, and they're proceeding with those even though the rules have been uh, stayed for the time. So, um, What you'll find is, is um, you'll still see some of the modern price increases, I think, that we're showing there. I think if you go on in the, you know, up to the 2015, you'll still see some, some energy prices in the 3 to 5% increases. Uh, it's going to be because of the modifications they're doing, not necessarily um, uh, because of fuel fuel price increases, because uh, natural gas basically is keeping coal down. So, um, so even though we don't use the, the the gas in the state on the on a national basis, it's helped us that way. So, how does the cost of power generation compare for natural gas versus coal? Yeah. Right now, it's very comparable. It is. Yep. Um, I found it interesting when I was doing some reading on this uh, this subject here, though, that um, just a price change on gas by 50 cents or a dollar greatly changes plans on utilities on what they want to do on coal conversion. 
So it's right now we're we're it's a it's we're right there at that margin. Uh, changes can affect it. So okay. correct me if I'm wrong. There's a there's a interesting dynamic going on here. Though. You said there's these regulations that were supposed to be put in and they're not going to be put in. Now you have Boiler Mac and a few others that are coming along in these stages of how regulations are being introduced or affecting whether you make these investments and stay with coal or convert. <clears throat> and right now, while well, well, gas is cheap, it's, it's very, it seems an often I'll go around and people say, well, why don't we just convert to that? It's the conversions that are often very expensive. And many, many of these states, usually there's, they're old power plants that they have to retire, or there's, there's plants that if you're considering making a uh, change over to gas to them, some of them have been paid off. Right? And, and so now you're having to turn over your rate payers, you know, a few millions or a few, perhaps a billion dollars in investment and, and what it's going to cost to upgrade a, a plant. And then with the potential, if, if these gas plays play out and with if people have this interest in trying to get gas prices back up again a little bit in order to, to, to find markets for them and keep the, the development happening, um, it, it could have a huge impact then on price, you know, going back to this. Uh, you know, you're saying that most of this is tied up not in the price of the, the fuel supply right now, but it's tied up in the conversions. But um, you know, we promote, we need all of it. You know, again, getting back to earlier, you know, the coal, it's kind of war on coal that people keep saying is happening is, is troubling because you know, we need a diverse supply and we have, we're the OPEC of coal in the world. We have uh, about 250 years of supply that we know we can get out with current technology. We have about 10,000 years of supply if we can find advancements in technology to get the rest of those resources out of the ground. And, um, so we're hoping with advancements there as well as perhaps um, advancements in clean, clean coal technology, ability to, to capture some of the CO2 and, and to be a little smarter in how we use it. Uh, might might uh, mean that we can use a resource for, for years to come. But uh, we exported more coal from the United States uh, this past year than we did uh, any, at any point in the last 40 years. Because there's markets that want it and they're willing to ship it overseas. Because uh, it's, it's hard to find some places where there's demand here right now with this with this changing and, and the rules and regulations and, this, and, and gas being cheap. Where's it going? Uh, mostly Asia. The hit in the Pacific, but there's places in Europe that still use it, but they're, they've moved away quite a bit from, from coal use, but uh, primarily Asia, the developing countries in the, in the, in the east. They're talking about uh, the big controversy in the northwest right now is <laughs> is uh, uh, ship loading facilities for coal to ship to, to mm -hmm. India and China. And and when you're moving all that coal and you got that transfer point, you're going to have extra uh, emissions there as far as coal dust. And, emissions and, and that sort of thing so they're they're not anxious to see that in the northwest either but. yeah it's becoming a problem kind of like keystone that these uh, people are trying to ship it from, primarily from what places in Wyoming and, and, and uh, big coal states up there to Seattle and, and out to those uh, Oregon and they're fighting the local folks are fighting that the permits there to try to, to be able to export uh, we, we kind of laugh that you can people we can export everything but energy in this country it's good to export goods and services but not energy we want to keep it here uh, there's people are fighting the export of, uh, they just built a new liquid natural gas facility, on, or permitted, I should say, in Louisiana to allow for uh, us to export some of this natural gas to markets. Uh, well, we were paying about $2 a kiloton, I think, for uh, natural gas. I don't know what it is, per thousand cubic feet, something. No, uh, but. Thousand it, cubic foot is, is the. About, um, yeah, it's about $2, I think it is. It's two, about $2.50 right 250. now, it's under 3 but in, in China, or Japan, which obviously is, is having trouble because their nuclear plants, they're paying $14. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other places in Asia that are paying 11 12 10 11 12 So a lot of them, that, and you're saying they're flaring. There's a lot of people who are looking to, to how can we start exporting some of this gas, even to take opportunity, advantage of the opportunity here. Um, and so there's some challenges with that. There's some challenges with, with uh, whether that's the direction we need to go in. There's challenges of whether we, how we can build the pipelines to move it around. So what's the rationale of the environmentalists to fight that? To fight exporting it? Yeah. A lot of them, I always like to, there's a, there's a belief that it's neither or proposition. That they, 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 they oppose, for the same reason some of these people oppose the pipeline. They didn't oppose the pipeline because they didn't like the pipeline. They opposed the pipeline because they didn't like the development of fossil energy up in Canada. And, and it's the same with coal, and, the, and it, they, they just fundamentally oppose the, the use of these energy. And then two is, they think when, if we're continuing to invest in, in coal and natural gas and, and um, these other resources development, we're not going to be investing in alternative energy. 
innovations, whether it's uh, with wind farms or solar power or other things. Yeah, but these wind farms got people employed full time to pick up dead birds. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not. We, it's we, not don't, the, we don't believe it has to be an either or proposition. We could use all of it. And, and, and frankly, there's hurdles that we have to overcome in order to be able to use all of it. And, uh, for the same thing you're saying that trying to build interconnects to, to get the wind energy from the places where the wind is. Uh, North Dakota, which is booming right now in, in uh, oil development, 15 years ago was was expected to be the um, OPEC of wind in this country. And they just have never been able to build the transmission lines because of the same problems that you have with building anything else these days. And, uh, uh, we, we actually did a project at the chamber called Project No Project, if you want to look it up. And they, they took a snapshot of about a two-year period of, um, just prior to last year, so it was like 2009, 2010, they identified about 400 projects in this country, energy projects, that had either been stalled, um, postponed, uh, stopped, and just taken off the books because of um, overregulation and green regulation. And 45% of those projects were uh, alternative energy projects. Solar power in, in the Mojave Desert, and wind farms in, in most states, and um, all sorts of things like that. So. We, we, we just believe that we need it all, and we have to have some, some ways to overcome some of these hurdles. Sir? I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a spouse of a landowner that just, I had to sign off on the... On the, um, um, the route? The first, the first route. I think it probably is around us now. But uh -huh. um, what it comes down to is, how does Tom's business benefit? You know, how can we get him cheaper, more cost-effective diesel fuel? I mean, that's about I me. Mean, if you're just being self disinterested mm -hmm. in us, I mean that's the bottom line. Um, at one point, there's supposed to be a, a a refinery, and the issue is how to get the last mile, mm -hmm. not not how to get the oil from here to Corpus Christi, yeah, but how to get the diesel to him. Sure. And so how um, there's supposed to be a a um, refinery in no, South Dakota or not? No. Last, I heard this last week. Yeah, they're working on permitting one in, in North Dakota right now. But but the last I heard is that they've given up on it. They they let their options go. I haven't heard that exactly, but I would. But that's just that's just from yeah. where I've heard last yeah. last you know. And so I guess the question is, how does Nebraska benefit? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we ship the all that oil to Corpus Christi, how much of it will come back in terms of refined product to here? Oh, well, oil is an international economy. So yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll, yeah. It'll, it'll, you know, so if somebody else wants to buy more, you know, how's yeah. it going to, how are we going to get him juice? It sure. should affect the supply and it should keep the price increases minimal. Yeah, the more diverse supply, the better. I, mean, I think, obviously, the more diverse supply, the better. The closer the, the distance yeah. it has to travel, the better. I mean, there, there's there's those sorts of basic, you know, economic things like we, we all understand. but. I, but that's why we're doing this, mm -hmm. is because I think people at the local level can, and when you talk to people like, you know, in these conversations, not just here, but when you go out and you leave here and you, and you go. But we'd be better yeah. off if there was a refinery right. in our geographic area. Sure. So that it would be cost beneficial to get him the diesel. Yes. Yeah. The, the investment opportunities for refineries has been really uh, bad. Um, in this country, it, it's a you're you're looking at anywhere from a twenty to thirty billion dollar investment to build a brand new one. Some people may back that down to about twelve billion. Um, as I mentioned, the last one they tried to build before in the Dakotas is the one in Arizona, and they were they already moved the location. They were in ten years of permitting, and they still hadn't gotten it permitted. Um, and right now, the refining sector is making traditionally it makes about three and a half percent return on investment. Um, it's, and it's, so it's, it's hard to attract capital to make this, this big investments right now. Um, there were points last year when the, we were saying about the prices going like this a bit, where um, <clears throat> their cost had gone up so much that they were selling at a loss, some refineries, but they just they keep them open, they're running because that's they're, they're, they, have to, they have to stay open for the next time the price goes up. And what you're seeing in California happening, they're willing to shut some of these things down because they don't know how they're going to meet some of the air quality regulations uh, right now. So yeah, the, but in the prospects in California, it was they had an electrical outage at one and had a fire at another one. Right, as I understand it. Right, and then the, and the, but then and then the price is being affected by oh, by yeah. supply. So it, it's a the transitioning to winter fuel, which is cheaper to, to produce. You know, the efficiencies uh, you get uh, are better because you're not running things through the refinery as long, but. Um, it's a problem, and it's going to be a real problem. And you're starting to see in the industry. You see ConocoPhillips just split. Phillips 
became the refining site. You know, where, where there had been integration before, they're splitting them off because there's there's investors and, and stockholders looking at these things like those are dogs. If somebody else wants to go and run that side of the business and make some try to make some money, go ahead. A marathon oil is split. Um, you're seeing Murphy Oil is trying to sell its two refineries. Uh, it's a hard business to be in right now. And the prospects, if you went through a chart, show that we're going to you know continue to need these products for going forward. But any growth that had been in the transportation sector and um, there is, there's going to be marginal increase in, in growth of, of the use of transportation fuels. Some of that's getting picked up by uh, biofuels right now. Uh, when you have this huge increase in biofuels use, it, it's taking off whatever had been a potential market for refiners. So they're, they're um, so refinery is a bottleneck. It is a bottleneck, and, it, and it's ever and that when was the last one built? Well, 1975. They've been the huge additions have been put on. In fact, you, you've expanded capacity, even though some of them closed in the 80s when. Um, there's been huge refinery expansion. They doubled the size of Marathon did of a refinery in Louisiana. There was a BP put a almost a four billion dollar investment into one in in Michigan, primarily to actually to handle the Canadian crude coming down from Canada. They used a lot of heavy oil there to refine it, so they needed that. Um, so there's been investments and there's been some capacity I I increase, but it's harder and harder and harder to see uh, the the business reason to do that. So you're right. I mean. You could you use a refinery here? There's a lot of places in the country I think would agree with you. They would they would love to have one. Um, but again, the marketplace. There's one of the uh, one of the interesting when you go to Anacortes, uh, Washington, and, and, and there's a refinery there, and people always complain because the cost of gasoline outside the refinery is often one of the highest points in the country, and it really has to do with how they distribute it. There's, it doesn't get distributed right there with the, the station, but. But around the state, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty inexpensive proposition. It just happens that the, that's the only gas station around, and they get their their fuel shipped in from somewhere else. So, so we really need to run a parallel track one on looking at the refinery issues, right? And make sure we got path capacity there. If you don't have the capacity for the refinery, right? You're oiled up. And there's also going to be some opportunities too. I think if if we natural gas continues to be you know, is going to be competing as a cheap fuel. I mean, uh, and T. Boone Pickens and some other folks who are trying to find markets for this gas are looking at what are the prospects for putting in transportation fuels, and what is that going to mean to those of you in transportation? I mean, this this, this community, you know, um, and 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 just frankly, I I mean, it's trying to be the, the glass half full person. We have a tremendous opportunity. I mean, the the these these marrying, you know, ten years ago we wouldn't have been talking about. Shell oil and shale gas. We've been talking about oil sands. I mean, there was a pretty static view of the of uh, the energy industry, and any growth was going to happen in renewables. And now you're looking at you know three percent unemployment in North Dakota. You're you're finding um, tremendous growth in, in northern Pennsylvania and Ohio. We we have a similar project to this. We just started called Shell Works for Us, and it's in four states right now in the Northeast. And eventually we might try to marry them, or we're trying to decide how we might do that. But it's all about this conversations that have to go on with business people and business leaders about these opportunities that are happening in the and in, in uh, with energy and we have a ton of it here um, more and more uh, you start to see think tanks talk about energy self-sufficiency uh, or energy independence um, that with if you look at Canada and, and the United States between the two of us if, if we can start using these resources that um, we might be able to be in the next 20 years someplace where we're we're exporting more energy that, and, and, uh, than we ever have, and we might be down to where we're only importing about four or five percent of our oil. Um, that's a huge, huge difference in my lifetime. I mean, I, growing up as a kid in the 60s and 70s, and you're looking at the, you know, embargoes and gas prices and all the sorts of things we've been living with ever since. Um, and, and, and also, as I mentioned too, about about uh, this either or proposition. You know, people think of innovation, and they often in energy, and they often think of wind and, and solar power, and those that sort of areas are. Uh, what are we going to do with natural gas or power? And how much solar can you get in the wind farms? The innovations that have been happening in, in the oil and gas sector and the coal sector are tremendous, and that's what's enabled us to marry old technologies with new ones and, and find ways to get gas that we would newer was in the ground and be able to utilize it. And I think as these innovations get better with how, how do we do it more cleanly and, and efficiently, it's, it's going to be I mean a lot in Canada in particular. Um, I, I, in, in 2001, I was in the Energy Department. One, one of the first meetings I had was with a businessman who had come to the Department of Energy, was looking for a grant, and he had a process he was wanting to take to a full-scale um, demonstration project to, to clean oil sands. And, and I didn't know anything about it, and I, I had a, one of the old-time bureaucrats, who was a crusty old guy who had been there for a long time, sit down with him, and the man's making his presentation, he just cut him off, and he said, look, we're not investing in that. It's never going to happen. If you want any money, he goes, Anyone, you go talk to the Canadians, go talk to the Chinese, uh, we're not going to give you any money. 
And he said, oil has to get to about $100 a barrel before that makes any sense, and that's not happening anytime soon. <laughs> well, you know, four years later, we're at $100 a barrel. Canadians are pumping money into, into uh, the resource, and as well as they found new ways to get at it. I mean, there's still a lot of the low-hanging fruit. They're strip mining up there, but um, they have this new process where they're using directional drilling, the same thing that enables us to, to, to get oil or to now to do the hydraulic fracturing. Um, the problem with oil sands is you have to, you have, when, you, when you mine it or you get it out of the ground, it's oil mixed with sand and water, and you have to separate the oil out. So now they're doing it underground. They pump two directional lines, and the top one is perforated and pumps steam out. The bottom one's perforated and collects the oil, uh, and, or, and they pump it back out of the ground, and, and they just do it underground. So their footprint's minimized, their efficiencies are getting better, they're finding ways to, to create this heat and energy much more cheaply. Um, I just had a call a few months ago from a Canadian company that we have oil sands in the United States or in Utah. And there's not a question of how much of the resource is there, but it's, it's different from the, the resource in Canada. And this company just got a permit to start a drill uh, about a month ago in Utah. And they found they couldn't use steam, but they're using a citrus-based product that separates the oil under the ground and is able to, to, to just because of the geology, just because of the geology and the difference in sand, the chemistry. So. Mm. Innovations are happening, and it's really fascinating to watch what's, and it could mean a, a lot to this country. But we have to find ways to, to overcome some of these hurdles and, and find ways to, to, to utilize it. I mean, that, that's, you, you know, the other, the other problem we're going to have is trying to figure out the rule of the road. And so um, that's why we're here. Question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you briefly talk to biofuels? You didn't, you, it's one thing you left out of your picture, but we're kind of sensitive to it around here. For sure. Real, heavy on the ethanol plants in this state. Yeah. And there, I know they're in the point where they're just not making money either. They just keep going along and no. trying to keep working. There was such a huge ramp up. I mean, I, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I mean, I was, I, would, I lobbied on the biofuels issues at the time. They were uh, in the 2005-2007 energy bills. Um, there were three issues that were supporting, the, three things that were supporting the, the biofuels. We did the mandate to how much you had to use, our renewable fuel standard. You had the um, get a tax credit, and they also had the tariff protection. Well, the tariff went away, expired last year. And you're also having, with the high cost of corn as an input, and also the um, demand having decreased, when a mandate's increasing, there's a lot of confusion, I think, in the industry. And I think there's some settling out of who is the, who had their business plan really dependent on those, those three kind of uh, subsidies and who didn't. Um, but you're right, there is, there is a big problem. I think you've had up to seven governors requesting right now a relief from, from having to meet the mandate. Uh, and going forward, they're going to have to sort out how they're going to utilize these waivers. Um, people in the biofuels industry want to really keep, it, keep them to, the, to what the standards were and what the requirements were for the... Um, but but it's, it's, it's had, that with the refiners having trouble buying the fuel and the cost going up, um, it, it's, and they're the ones who are going, obviously, to the, the and working with some of the, the food and feed folks who are concerned about the cost of uh, the competing corn with, for feed. Um, they're, they're have to sort out how these waivers are going to work and if they do work or not. There's people in the ethanol industry, if you, if you put any of these waivers and maybe extend the dates out a little bit, then would you have to meet some of these standards? Um, the refineries and people say we'll be able to meet them. But um, the food, the, the ethanol, in, people have been heavily invested in are finding that it's, uh, it's going to screw up their business plan. So there has to be some meeting of the minds somewhere, and I don't know, quite know where it's going. But with um, the tariff went away, and with the tight budget si si uh, situation, there's certainly people are going to look at to target the, the subsidy. The, uh, and, and so I, I think that they're going to have to be digging in and fighting real hard to maintain their subsidy right now going forward. Um, so they're, they're in a bit of trouble. Um, the future's still there, though. I think there's people who, and again, the same advancements. We haven't resolved the cellulosic ethanol challenge, but um, people are still trying to put money into that and finding a way. Um, and, and for the, the refiners and the, the big oil industry companies, that's where they're looking most. They're putting a lot of their money. And they're not, they're, some of them own a lot of the uh, Valero owns a lot of corn ethanol plants, and Marathon owns some as well. But um, the cellulosic is where they think they can get the biggest bang for their buck, um, both from having to meet the standard as well as uh, uh, the, the, re the requirements on the renewable fuel standard, but also from um, just the practical viewpoint of, of trying to find a, a fuel source that's a little better than corn for them. Um, there's also a problem with the wind energy tax credit, as you mentioned. There was a wind production tax credit that's been in place, uh, 
on and off since 1992, and that's really screwed up the wind energy uh, industry. It's supposed to expire at the end of the year, and, and um, if you track development in that industry, you'll see that uh, when the production tax credit's in place, there's a lot of uh, people building wind farms, and there's a lot of people uh, manufacturing parts for them. But when the production tax has gone away a few times, it, the production goes to almost zero. So um, again, directionally, we have to figure out what we're going to do and, and find ways to um, get that industry to a point where they can operate without a subsidy and, and make sense. Um, at the chamber, we support all these these projects, um, particularly with things like the subsidies or with um, <coughs> the production tax credits. We believe they have to sunset at some point. It only makes sense um, if there's there's industries all along the way, including the oil industry, and along the way that's gotten some help to um, start being innovative and, and ways to try to get their uh, new innovations to market, but um, in the long term they have to be able to stand on their own. So there should be subsidy. I don't know what the sunset is on the subsidy for biofuels. I don't know what it should be for, for the wind production tax credit, but there should be some point in time where we, the, the taxpayer stops subsidizing these things and they, they can stand on their own in the marketplace. But there, there's some real, I don't know the answer on biofuels, but it is a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. How does the Nebraska delegation, the congressional delegation, um, how do, what kind of a handle do they have on this? Have they been involved, friends, foes? Um, on, on the power or the or what we're doing here at the, at the chamber? Or? Anything associated um, with partnership to fuel. I think they've been pretty uh, support. You know, we obviously we were on the other side of the uh, the, the issue with, with Senator Johans on, on the, on the pipeline issue. Um, Lee Terry has taken a further, you know, obviously the other extreme, but they're, they've been pretty supportive. I, 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 you know, we've communicated to them what we're doing. They know we come into the state and we talk to people. Um, you know, they're certainly have, have been supportive along the way. I can't, I can't see other than Senator Johan's feelings early on on the pipeline where, where we completely disagreed with them, um, that we've had any, any, any sort of, of concern. Overall. Overall, then. yeah. It's nine o'clock right okay. now. Are there any? Maybe do you have a final, final words? No, I'm in the discussion space. <laughs> All right, great, great. Any other uh, final questions? Bye. Comments. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I, I, I'm hoping that if um, if you have any other questions you want to send them on, I'm happy to answer them. If something comes up over you know over cocktails or a meeting at work or some other place, you know, and you have a question about energy that. We might be able to help, or I hope, or I hope Tim is, is willing to do as well. You know, feel free to, to contact us. And if you haven't signed up um, yet for the, the partnership, or you know other people who might be interested, please uh, pass along the information. And we're going to continue to try to keep you informed and, and be a resource for you going forward. Um, you want to mention these? There's, there's some information. Some information here. folders here, and here's a flash drive that has the PowerPoint and some other information. So please take this with you and uh, share it. And uh, yeah, and then. Visit the website. Where are you getting? Where are you headed from here? Um, I actually meeting um, the. I'm I'm going to be actually meeting in Las Vegas with a number of um, state and local chambers. There's probably well over a hundred from around the country who will meet once a year. Last year was in Chicago, and um, so I'm getting off the official partnership trail to go talk to them. But so I'm talking about the partnership. No other visits in Nebraska? Would Not today, no. Um, well, we have a we're meeting with some reporter this morning here in Grand Island, and then um, and no other meetings here today. I, I think it's important that we do emphasize the fact of how much uh, yeah, oil we're, we're getting from Canada. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's understood um, across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned also, uh, and I don't want to dwell on refineries because there's a lot more into this, but you did mention the, the upper Midwest refineries. Right. How many of them are there? Because we always think of the Gulf. Right, mm -hmm. right. In this area. So is that, I mean. There's, uh, I, yeah, I don't know how many, I could off the top of my head, yeah. like a states. I mean, Indiana, um, Michigan, Illinois has a number of them, uh, Missouri. Um, And are those? And they're all supplying. Are, are those independents, or are they part of? Oh, no, they're big. Like, like the big. Where, where I first was involved with with um, this issue was back about four or five years ago. Um, BP was having uh, a lot of challenges at the local level expanding right. the refinery, and it was uh, initially targeted at air quality, but in, uh, 
come to find out it was really some of the environmental community targeting the oil sands and, and their use of, of oil sands. They're, they're yep. really interested in bringing in more. Right. And again, that was a three and a half million dollar investment that was going to, in, in a huge project, employing thousands of workers up there. And, um, and that's when they first came and did, uh, said API and started asking us about it. But um, there, there is a lot of, a lot of there's a refinery in California, there's a, in, in, uh, 140 some odd, depending on how many are operating, there were refineries or whatever is going on, or some of them are down, but about 140 some odd um, refineries in the country, in varying sizes of, uh, in, in capacity. So, um, but again, there hasn't been a new one built in uh, almost 40 years. Any other questions for Matt before we send him on his way? Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And, and uh, please spread the good word and uh, keep us informed. If there's any questions or anything, uh, other groups you think might benefit, please pass them along. We're happy to help out.